I never actually thought I'd paint armies. I thought my intention was to paint single miniatures for heavy metal. I got bored real quick. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about big army projects for you that doesn't scare you? I've never copied a colour scheme. That's usually why your army ends up being a bit of a, a, a car crash. When someone says to me like, oh, what, what are you painting tonight? I'm like, I'm, I'm doing 40 skeletons. They'll be like, oh, I'm only painting one. And I'm like, oh, I'm painting 40 because it's fun. It does feel like the, the kind of fundamental like essential tip to army painting is like. So I just went down to the shop just to get some tea. I couldn't, I couldn't decide what to, what to pick up and I need some advice. And who else better to ask than Peachy Tips? <laughs> <laughs> Best man, welcome to Peachy Tips. Yorkshire tea. You, oh, There's only one Peachy Tips is, is pretty good, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> That's but, the, the best variation of the guest introduction trope that you've got so far I think I, I, I was I was brewing that one brewing for quite some time yeah. 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 Nice. I just want to say for the record he pitched that to me like two days ago he's been like preparing <laughs> don't think that was just like off the cut yeah. why, the why, one why, one. why do you want to ruin the, ruin the magic the, <laughs> like, like, the on. original one was when I think we had it was either the looting one or the mini wargaming Dave one and James was like yeah for days he was like yeah and I think I'm just going to do this thing where I'm like I was walking around outside and I just happened to see the. He was like so proud of it. Okay, so if anyone watching, they have just killed every introduction moving forward. Oh, we're now. doing them every time. We're doing them so, every time. So no, we have to we have to stick to the bit now. We've established <sighs> yeah, it, like, yeah. in the in the law. So the law. Yeah, it's not forty k. Come on, yeah, it's like the podcast law. We've okay. got our own little. We've got all the Jamesisms. We've got our own lexicon. <laughs> okay, all right. Welcome to Paint Perspective. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, how are you? I am great. Good. I am great. Peachy, you could say. No, yeah, good. Say oh, oh, puns are flowing God, today. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going to be one of them episodes. I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. So we're really, really glad to have you here. Obviously, to chat about our favourite thing, which is obviously miniature painting. Mm. Uh, you've got a vast swathe of experience with that across all different, all different platforms and all different sort of mediums and stuff, which mm. is really, really good. Um, I just thought it'd be really interesting to get your opinion on various different things about obviously miniature painting. Um, we've got a massively wide demographic of different types of painter that watch the show or listen. Um, and yeah, it's just really good to have you with the experience you've got and, and obviously talk about the awesome things that you're doing now. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, you say experience, definitely no talent. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. I don't There's know about that. Some experience for no, sure. I don't know about that. I think, I think you're being very, very humble. But no, I think, yeah, you definitely, like, I, I remember um, seeing you in sort of like, early GW books that mm. I, when I used to, like, I think there's some painting books that I've got that you're in as well. It's a very young, like the young version of you. Don't take that the wrong way. Yeah. Um, you're in the hair version. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't remember the photographs that much. Yeah, there's definitely in, hair. Okay. Got it. <laughs> but, but no, I thought, I thought it was really good um, to sort of get someone on that's had all different aspects of experience uh, from working obviously for Games Workshop, for doing obviously your own thing you've been doing recently, um, and then just talk about the future of you, about obviously the things that you're doing moving forward as well, which, mm. I, which I think is good. Um, so yeah, so I think for, for the show, like we want to obviously talk about sort of like uh, painted armies and other things like that. And it's, it's often a topic which a lot of people sort of struggle with. Mm. Um, and, and having someone that's worked in that environment and worked on armies and that consistency and all those kind of things, I just thought it'd be a really good thing to, to, to sort of open the floor of discussion and talk to you about. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those weird things. I never actually thought I'd paint armies. I thought my intention was to paint single miniatures for heavy metal when I was a wee little nipper looking through White Dwarf going, oh, I want to do that. It'll cool. Um, and I think it came into its being probably when I was in retail, like painting stuff for the cabinets, really enjoyed like painting stuff for the, the boards, the gaming boards, the, the cabinets and stuff. And then a job came up to, to do armies. Yeah, yeah. The workshop, I was like, oh, that sounds fun. I'm going to do that. That sounds great. Got a job. And I had a couple of chances, well, I say chances, um, opportunities to sit with heavy metal and do some painting. And this was like, oh, this is great. I get to learn how to be an heavy metal painter. I got bored real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I had, I had um, I, and I think it must be my like makeup. I don't know if it's, it's something to do with me just being very impatient or just having a short attention span or something like that. But I had a couple of tasks where one was painting a Stegadon and the crew and I was three days in and I, I was done in my head. Uh -huh. I was happy enough for the models and every metal were like, it could do with a little bit more. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so done with this now. I've got, to, <laughs> I've got to admit, the scales on like a Stegodon or something like that, that is a lot of edge highlighting. <laughs> that is well, a lot of edge highlighting. It was. I mean, that yeah. was the thing. Is like, I, I, that I, I kind of enjoyed doing. And then like uh, Neil Green or Nibs as, as he's known in, in workshop, or show me he's like painting textures on, mm. on skin and stuff. And that was fun. So I learned lots from there. But then like four days later, I'm still like, I can't see past this. I, I think my brain was just like, you see these heavy metal painters and like high-end painters and they do amazing things. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think from my point of view, there's something out there for everybody. But mine is like, yeah, I, I, I see the craft. I appreciate the craft. It's amazing. But I personally just don't have the drive to to want to get to that point because I could have painted another 50 um, Empire State Troops in that time or I could have done another, you know, army of Urukai or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Where do you think that stems from? Is it like just you enjoy having different stuff and like moving on to the next thing? I think thing? so. I, I, think, I think it's um, having... I go back to the short attention span, maybe. Uh, some people say, Peach, I think you've got ADHD. I was like, I don't even know what that means, but sure. <laughs> uh, I, I just like to move on to new things and and I think scratching lots of itches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I struggle to focus on one thing for a long period of time. Uh, That's interesting though, because a lot of people's like nature of loving the speed is like, oh, I've got this limited time and I want to paint armies for games. But you don't hear a lot of people saying, like a lot of people who, who would say, oh, I've got a short attention span. They just want to jump from like single figure to single figure. Not yeah, necessarily yeah. like big army projects. Yeah. That's quite interesting to hear. Yeah, do, doing the armies, it's, it's weird as well because it's a lot of figures and there's a certain amount of discipline required. So when someone says to me like, oh, what, what are you painting tonight? I'm like, I'm, I'm doing 40 skeletons. They'll be like, oh, I'm yeah. only painting one. I'm like, oh, I'm painting 40 because it's fun. <laughs> and I could play a game to them tomorrow or whatever. So it, it was definitely something that, that I really enjoyed doing. I don't do as much nowadays. I find that my... Um, attention span and like scratching those itches come from doing like a warband or a kill team or mm -hmm. a, a necromunda gang um i don't think I, I can be bothered to do an army anymore i think um uh oh, lockdown lockdown killed that um, and the only reason is i painted three armies during lockdown never got to play a single game with it no. <laughs> i uh, mean that'll do it I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and i was yeah. like <laughs> I'm just going to do some small squads instead. <laughs> yeah, no, so I got more done. <laughs> no, totally. I, I think it's really interesting as well. Like, like there's, I think there's direct correlation for like execution between painting a someone who paints a model really high end and invests hours and hours and mm. hours into it, and then someone who invests almost the same applicable amount of time into producing an army that what for whatever whatever standard it's painted to, it's the presentation of the army. Yeah, and yeah. and just having that large swathe of, of force or something to actually have function with afterwards. I think they're very similar. Like they, that the drive to achieve those results, I believe, is very, very similar. It's just the type of execution or the way it's approached is the thing that actually differs. Yeah. And that's really the interesting thing. Like you've got people like yourself, obviously, they've got a lot of army experience. You, you've obviously done in the early days, you've done stuff that's obviously higher end, definitely. That's one of the things I think that um I, I definitely wanted to speak about with yourself obviously coming on is that I know that you're known for painting, obviously, and being in the army painting team hmm. and managing that team in the past, etc. But you still can paint to a very, very decent standard. I think you don't from what I've seen on conversations, I think that's not maybe conveyed as much as it as I'd like to talk about. Because I think yeah, I've seen yeah. stuff you painted and it is very, very good. So I think that, that talking about armies in the nature and being able to do both sides of the of the coin, so to speak, just gives you a good skill set to approach whatever project you tackle, which yeah. is which is quite good. But yeah. Yeah. It's um a few people have asked asked me about that, saying that, you know, you you, you paint what to a high you, I've seen you paint to a high standard before, but you don't do that much nowadays. And I think a lot of that stems from uh, being in the Womba TV team, doing lots of tuition videos, and yeah. then having so like take Duncan for instance, he he paints really nicely and has like a, a set of standards he follows, which is like base coat, layer, mm -hmm. shade, highlight, highlight. I try and find um, shortcuts to get things on the tabletop, but still look quite cool from a distance because I always play at arm's length when I'm painting. I'm always like arm's length kind of yeah. like uh, level, so it looks fine to me from there because that's the distance I'll be playing games at. Um, and through doing all those videos, I was always like looking for hacks or shortcuts to get things looking cool, but, you know, usable on the tabletop, mm -hmm. knowing I can paint better, but I think it's that working in retail, doing those paint sessions, doing those videos to try and help people realizing that there's a lot of paint guides out there that focus on very high end techniques, which mm -hmm. is really good because once you get to a certain point, you, you can do that. So an, an example is like you, you see DIY videos um, on YouTube showing you how to, I don't know, refit glass in a window or mm. how to refit a door. I'm like, but what happens if people don't know how to do certain things like using a screw or you know, screwdriver very well? Or <laughs> yeah, like, like the basic <laughs> things. Like, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. all, all, all those things that you've, you've assumed knowledge mm -hmm. before you've even got to like the fitting of the door, you know, sizing it up getting the right kind of materials or, you know, where do you go for these kind of things and stuff like that. So I was always of the mind that there's a lot of guides that teach you some really cool next step skills and they're not really good, but there's very few that teach those fundamentals, those mm -hmm. basics. 
Um, do you think content has kind of in general online kind of created that sort of one upping effect? Where I think so. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's really, really cool to see all the different things people do, but I, I, I do feel it's had an impact on people's perceptions on painting. They see all this stuff and think, Oh, that's really good. I wish I could paint like that. And a lot of people watch them because they want to paint like that, but they inevitably struggle to get to that point. Whereas in my head, I'm like, there's such a big gap of like, I don't even know the numbers, but I'm going to like be generous and say 80% of our customer base probably can't paint to that standard or no. don't have the time. And th this is the thing I think I, I, I do feel is forgotten. There's a lot of people that paint really well, but they have eight hours a day Yeah, or for like five days a week, like, you know, taking Duncan or Louise, that's, that's their job now. They do it all day, every day. Um, Rich, Gray, you know, that's that's one of his, you know, focus points is like, you know, sitting there doing the high-end stuff and whatever. But a lot of folks out there are at school, college, uni, parents, you know, it's kind of, you get an hour if you're lucky in an Thanks, evening. Yeah. And that, that's where my mindset is for for the painting. Yeah, I was yeah. like, what, if you had a new box set and you only had two hours this week. What could you get done? Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, kind of that balance of like inspiring people and showing what's possible, but also making it accessible on the other end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I guess once I, they've used me, they can then go off and watch all those other videos and learn to paint even better. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I'm just like the bottom rung of a ladder and there's many rungs to, to climb. I, I think totally. I think the other thing as well is like with, with the type of audience that that, that kind of attracts as well, it, it really gives a, a very broad area for you to work within as well. So you get lots of people that will look to you as the first point of really how to achieve stuff that they're, happy with on the tabletop and that's always a memorable thing as well so like i, I remember like from back in the day, places i started learning from etc and you'd always remember that hmm. through your for your painting journey so to speak so it's quite good that you're you're starting at that that level and helping people to progress in in that way from from the beginning as well i think when you're there at the beginning as well people hold it a lot more like with some sentimental value when they look back because yeah. it's like i thinking of getting back into it, i started painting again after i had a break about 2017 or something so i have like fond memories of watching duncan on warhammer tv yeah. teaching me how Same. to paint again <laughs> you know I mean? um, well similarly then, i'm from i started painting being younger i started painting around like 2018 and that was like off of back of your content as well so oh, right. oh yeah. gosh yeah. <laughs> i feel so old yeah, <laughs> yeah. well i think uh, for me i don't know when were you should we just, sorry to like take it back a few mm. steps, but I think because a lot of this relates to what your career trajectory yeah. was within GW as well. And also we've got a lot of people who probably got into painting after you left, so might not even recognize you from that yeah. side of it. Should we just go through a quick like brief timeline, timeline of your yeah. painting career? <laughs> yeah. Brief. Yeah. Brief. I know it's, I know it's so fast. I guess I know it's fast. I don't want it to be the whole podcast. But yeah. Just for anyone, as a, as, a, as a lad, and to add some context, I, I, I did a, a lot of painting in, in my own time when I was like school, college, uni, and then I got a job at workshop, which was two thousand, two thousand and one, just before Lord of the Rings kind of hit the hit the screens. Um, and I was in retail for about seven, eight years, then moved to what? Well, the design studio at the time, not the books and box game studios it is now and i guess that was like what 15 years 12 years give or take and then moved into warmer tv after that and then left 2021 20, yeah so 21 years so there's a lot of long time in with, with that experience and yeah. i guess i i just thought it was important because it obviously even so far in this discussion like so much of your experience with these different you know painting armies or whatever it just relates to what you were doing for work at that time i suppose yeah i the, the I, I mean i learned a lot in the in the, the very first two weeks i joined the studio um i thought i was all right at painting because i used to do stuff for the cabinets and you're in a very insular group of like yeah. mates and stuff in one store and then within like a week i'm like oh my god <laughs> these people are so talented and my my skill just went up because i was sat on in a chair for eight hours a day painting toy soldiers and you know your, your skill set's going to rapidly improve especially when you've got people around you just like looking at you going, you know what you could do? I'm like, oh yeah, use some sponge. I'm like, what? <laughs> What's this? Sponge? That's where that echoed. Yeah. The light comes <laughs> that's what I've, I've spoke about so much is that's what I have here with these two. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, I'm on the office side of things, but every time I have to, every week I have to sit down and have a conversation with these two for two hours about painting. And I'm like, next time I go to sit down and paint, I'm like, okay, well, I can't do that shortcut because I know I've got like George in this ear. Like, while I'm painting, so don't do that. Um, yeah, and we've tripped ourselves up as well with stuff we've said on the show 
and like kind of have these realizations like while we're having these conversations about things that I think I should probably be doing myself. And then when yeah. I go to make that same mistake or like crutch again, I'm like, can almost hear James or like myself speaking. on Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, like, normally it's like, <laughs> like things like I spoke quite early on about how I didn't like sub assemblies. Hmm. And I didn't realize that everyone who decided to listen to that would then pull me up every time I post a picture of a sub assembly. <laughs> like I'm not allowed to do sub assemblies anymore. I get like yeah. loads yeah. of messages every time I post one. Where it's like, oh, I thought you didn't like sub assemblies. It's like, well, okay, I said it once. Like, <laughs> I mean, because I, 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 I probably sympathize with you on that one because sub assemblies, I, I, I find the only time I do it is when it's really necessary. Like yeah. it's yeah. like cavalry and a rider and yeah. two separate things. I can spray one, one color, spray them in another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which or, I did caveat when I said, uh, just for everyone, <laughs> just as an update for everyone, I did say, when I said I did like sub assemblies, we then did say like, yeah, sometimes it's it's understandable or you need to or it's shielded yeah. in certain details and I, things like that. I'm going to confess something now. Normally, when I was in the army painting team, I used to really like get on the backs of the staff going, drill your barrels, drill your barrels. And yeah. I got pulled up on it once for one of my videos on the painting phase. And so I was like, oh, you're not drilled your barrels. Like, I'm not going to drill them ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Just to annoy you. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great way of getting it back. But yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> It's I like, like I'd be I do try and drill my barrels, but the problem I have is that I'm rubbish at it. So I always drill it, ruin the barrel and go, I shouldn't have drilled it. <laughs> shouldn't have drilled yeah. it. Yeah. Just is it like the off center. Black kind paint of thing? dot, black paint dot should would have been fine. Well, I don't know if you uh, if you know this, Peachy, but James uses a massive like DeWalt drill with like a one mil drill bit on it. <laughs> he just tears swears by thing. that. Yeah. They call me the DeWalt sniper. <laughs> so it's yeah. unreal. I'm like, sat there with like my little tiny pin vice trying to be really precise. Like, I'm going to use a term I used on a previous episode, which was I will out drill you fact. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there, there's a heated yeah. argument about that on the yeah. well, to quote To quote yourself, James, in one of your previous James-isms, that is like trying to kill an ant with a nuke. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I mean, what's your ratio for getting it centre? Well, see what you do is with a pin vice, you, you have to do the notch in the center of the barrel. Yeah, anyway, of course. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's all about time and efficiency for me. Like, especially when it comes to the topic we've got at hand, which is army Sorry, painting. Dead serious <laughs> talking about using a full on drill hey, to I, drill his I, I, I have barrels. converted many people to the power of electricity. So like, all I, all I would say <laughs> is that you get the knife and get it, you make the notch perfectly center. Yeah. 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 The, little, the tip, we're going to do an early episode hobby hack here. If you go do the side, as in the muzzle break yeah, first, yeah, yeah. when you drill, put the drill, bar, the, the drill bit on the notch, it'll go straight through. And as soon as it heat, uh, hits the hole that the muzzle break hole has done, it'll guide it through centre, if that makes sense. I see, yeah, yeah. So it works every time. Yeah, but this is just the, the extra part of where you're using a power tool and it's but like he's skipping way the bit too much. Where if you mess it up, you've got a 9,000 RPM <laughs> hot bit of metal that just... <laughs> Oh, when you're drilling for blooming oil, like, like, <laughs> like, 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 like all I would all I would say is that like the, the trigger control on a power tool is exactly the same as like your pressure management with a brush and all those kind of things. Mm. You get used to like the trigger has got a, 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 <laughs> it does it, it does it actually does human. You're, you're sat there. You can it's sit like there. A momentary this is switch. this is not. Like, it's all I'm nothing. sorry. There's no to, finesse. I'm not dropping this early because there's a certain topic that's going to get very heated later on involving <laughs> oh, colours. So let's not. But this is not the new version of. That. All I would say is that if you just get used to the trigger on an electric drill, you'll find that you can drill stuff a lot quicker. You're not sitting there getting RSI in your hand, drilling all the barrels out all the time. RSI? Yeah. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. <laughs> we'll see see what I have to plant we'll with every week. This is just while we're recording. Years later, you've got a broken hand or something, you know, so like, you know, like it, is, it is what it is. But yeah, I use, I use a, uh, and it isn't a DeWalt. It, I use a really, really old. More of a Milwaukee drill. man. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, I like a Bosch. Thank you very much. Like, you know, like, uh, no, but the, I use a an old uh, an old Bosch drill that's been like I've had for years, and it, yeah. it, you know, it's it, it's it, you won't drill screws in the wall or anything with it. So it's quite old, and the batteries they don't last as long, and etc. 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 But it's perfect for drilling barrels, and you can just get through them really quickly. So if you listen at home, all you need is a really, really old drill that's no good anymore. So that it's <laughs> or just get up. just get a budget one that's not has got more power than the national grid. Like you know, like it's as simple as that. Like, but no, I, yeah, I I personally use it and recommend it because it means you can just get through stuff efficiently. Um, and once you've got the trigger control on the drill, it's just about getting the notch perfect. Drill the muzzle brake because that's a hole to guide you. You can literally yeah. just do that straight away. Or you can make the step that Peachy just told us all about and just decide to never drill it again. It's not a problem. 
whatever you want 100% to do. 100% success rate. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I suppose if you've got like 100 space yeah. marine barrels to drill through. When you've got a lot to you've do. You've got the hand-eye coordination and the skill set going on then. Yeah. It, it, honestly, yeah. I will caveat that if you're watching this and you give it a go first time, if you do ruin your barrels, it's not my fault. So, <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> use a test model. Yeah, use a test, use test model. model first. No one's ever had to give that caveat when recommended a pin by. So yeah. 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 Anyway, anyway, painting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> painting, painting. painting. Yeah. So, um, so obviously the Atomic Games Workshops gave you a real good insight into like vast projects like army painting and being consistent and all that kind, hmm. of, kind of thing. So like, what have you found like for your own hobby through working in that environment and being sort of like through, I, I think in terms of osmosis, being in that environment all the time and obviously being surrounded by it. What are some like things that like you picked up straight away from being in that environment that not only helped you with your personal hobby, but then also helped you with, with your work as you were working there? I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, Certainly, when I was hired to do the army painting stuff, I was always the back ranker guy. So there was a lot of a lot of standards that you could drop. Mm -hmm. um, so from an army painting point of view, if you uh, want to do like a you know two thousand foot army in a short space of time, you, you you can find those shortcuts of what to highlight and what not to yeah. highlight. So if I was doing like a space marine and I've got belts on it and pouches, I'm probably going to paint them black maybe pick out the odd little bit of a highlight or dry brush over it or paint it really dark gray and wash it mm -hmm. and then that's that's everything highlighted and that was the same for a lot of things that if you could find a shortcut or a way of trimming down the time and put your efforts into things that people will see and one of the things you know you guys probably know anyway is like you know the face most people look at the face of a model before they look at anything else so yeah. um, that's where your efforts go it's usually this part of the the head and the the shoulders and everything else you can be a little bit more Lucy goosey about um and color uh, i think color was important so punching out those colors getting like your, your spot colors right and just having it looking nice and bright from a distance but um certainly when i started you'd have like heavy metal would do the first five so if you take warhammer fantasy battle you have like 20 scaven in a unit i always use scaven as a random <laughs> example so you have like five at the front which were painted by heavy metal i'll do then the next 15 that went behind it but the first group of 50 would have to be a little bit better mm. because they're the second rank in that you'd see and then the ones after that can really cut corners it's almost like a fade in, in a fade through yeah the unit. yeah it's really interesting in a weird way from a from my point of view i'd paint want to paint them all the same standard but mm. it made sense from a photography point of view that you had different gradients of of level it never yeah. occurred to me that that was how how you guys did that over there and certainly yeah. then we yeah, did yeah. and then eventually it was every metal did all the box cover stuff themselves because uh, the team just grew and grew because i think when i joined it was like it's, it's, it was only seven but still you know they had a big workload um but now they're on like 12 13 staff now so they're just like pounding through all sorts of things but i also think that their levels increase so much that they've made a rod for their own back that things take even longer a great example was like daz Lavem. he did um, a load of color variants for chaos uh, when the chaos warrior book came out when i started and he did like a bunch of color variants for the nights and that was like a day two days and you look at the color variant this is like that's amazing that was two days skip four ten years they're doing a, a varangard night which is black with gold trim 15 days for the one figure and i'm like i bet does could do that in a day <laughs> just a quick one we wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at seed studios we offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience you can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's interesting. Like that jump in, in time allowance is, is massive. Like, yeah. Um, it, yeah, I said like when, I, th I think the interesting thing, I mean, just segueing slightly into, into obviously just general painting, like painting in, in general over the years. I mean, I, we were talking about this on the previous episode, like, painting the, the quality just from someone starting out like some of the some people's first models oh, yeah. are like like insane like um i think I'm, i benefited from like because i got into i started like properly in like 2018 and by that point there's like a backlog of like almost yeah. 10 years worth of youtube videos to watch yeah at all sort of varying skill levels so and kind of like you said as well like starting out with some more basic fundamentals and then you can kind of work your way up from there it's a completely different playing field than it is now yeah oh yeah i mean when uh, I, than it was back in the day so, yeah, yeah you you had undercoat a couple of base coats a wash then heavy metal 
That was literally, it was like one, two, three, heavy metal. We always used to joke about that. But it, it was true. It was like, how do I get from that to that? It's like hop, hop, hop skip and a jump top of Everest. Yeah, it's, it's, like, yeah. Yeah. it's that meme of like an owl where it's like, I'm, I'm yes, so glad, yeah. I'm so yeah. glad yeah. You, you brought that up. I know the person who drew that. I know the person who oh, did really? that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I know the person who did that. Yeah. yeah. Shout out, Stephen. Hi, <laughs> yeah. Steve. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how I feel what, but shout out, Steve. Um, yeah, that's the first thing I just thought of. It's like, paint the rest of the owl. Yeah. Yeah, I know the person who did that. Yeah. Anyway, that's so a flex. Yeah. 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 That's a flex. <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely moved on, has it, from when we were it's, with it, youth? It's, but it's, like I said, kind of earlier, sorry to cut you off. No, it's all good. But like, things now, I feel like I'll kind of get into a point of like one upsmanship. And like, I guess we're in part guilty of that because we do paint a lot of higher end stuff but especially from the sense of like the content space i think that there is kind of kind of this shift now kind of going back to the fundamentals a little bit so i mean yeah absolutely but i, I think with siege it, it it's perfect because a lot of people like myself would i, I would love to paint to that standard but faster but still get to that standard mm. so like spend like a couple of hours a night and then get to the standard that you guys do. Everyone would love that because time's our most precious resource, right? You sure. can get it back. Yeah. But if you've got the money and or you, you've got the, you know, the means to like get someone else to paint it for you, mm -hmm. you can get the standard that you want or you've always wanted because there's people like you that, that can su supply that service, mm -hmm. which I think is a really, really good thing. It means you don't have to then go, oh, you know, do I cut corners here? Do I cut corners there? No, I can make a really beautiful piece that looks amazing because someone's paying for that and that's what yeah. they want. And then they get that. They don't have to spend the evening doing it because, you know, they've saved up cash to do it. And I think it's a, it's a great thing. Whereas like someone myself, when I was a kid, I was like, how do I paint like that? I'll just keep painting models until I get better. And, yeah, yeah. you know, over the years, you, you find ways. And I certainly think like young Chris Peach, when he was like 13, would spray everything white and then just base coat everything badly and then black the, line everything exactly yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like skip like 20 years later just like what's what's the closest undercoat color i can get to the majority of that model right yep. okay so most of it's going to be like white all right i'll spray it white or most of it's gonna be red i'll spray it red and i'll pick out all the colors um so i'm always like finding like ways to to so you know cause I'm, what 43, nearly dead. So. <laughs> I mean, slightly more, but yeah. Okay. Well, to be fair, using, using James's math. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. But, but no, I mean, that's, that's, that's really cool the way, obviously, like, you know, with regards to sort of like finding the process and finding a way of doing it. And I, and I, I actually, I, I actually say this all the time in regards to socials. So we talk about it quite a lot on, on, on these episodes. And the thing is, is like, one of the things that I call it is like, almost like, I'm going to say Instagram, but it's like being Instagram drunk. Like you go on there and you just, you're, bombarded by all this stuff yeah, yeah. and it, and it's just like trying to you you are quite right in what george in what you said george it's just like trying to keep keep up with the joneses so to speak yeah. you see what i mean and it's like liam made a really good point on the last episode like he was like i'm just not not gonna look on on instagram he's got he's got one that uses for your personal life or whatever blah blah but he just turned off and and just didn't start looking at anything hobby orientated mm. and that kind of really lit the fire in him he's like oh actually you know i've done i enjoy that model i think as a, as a real baseline thing, like painting something, looking at it going, okay, what, what am I not happy with? What am I happy with? And then do, trying to do another one and progressing from that to the model to the first, to the next model, that gives you more of a reward than going on there and going, and I'm going to say it again, I think it's becoming like a point scoring thing on episodes, <laughs> but it's that, it's that Homer Simpson barbecue moment of like, why doesn't mine look like that? Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that's the, that, that's the thing that I think the social media, as good as it is for painting, I think it also nowadays with how much it bombards us both on YouTube, on Instagram, on Pinterest, on Google Images, like on everything. It's, it's our industry has grown so much since 10, 15 years ago mm. or whatever. And the internet has almost like exploded the, the level quality. Like I remember going to GD like in 96 and like 97 when I was I went with my family, took me because I wanted to go. Um, and then like, as I was going, when I was a bit older with friends, I used to get the bus from the store. Like, every, like the, the, the buses used to go, like you used to have like, your flag and all that stuff for the store. Of course, yeah, used to, yeah. Used to go, you know, store banner, that. store banner, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and then to see like GD, the quality at Golden Demon as, as an example is like a because I, I see that as like kind of like a metric of painters in the community. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Like you go there and you see all manner of different paint jobs and people painting to the best that they can do for the competition. Back in the day, the quality was it was amazing at the time, obviously. But where it is now is is insane. Like yeah. it's just like you look at some stuff that's being done, like the likes of Rich, uh, Rich Gray, or otherwise known as the Wizard. Or I don't know, um, <laughs> you know. Wizard, uh, yeah. But but like you know, it's just it's just crazy. So 
I think your approach and doing stuff and starting flipping it almost the other way and going, well, look, you, there's loads of that stuff out there, yeah, yeah. but I'm going to focus on the thing, which is the core of what builds to that in the future. I think that's a really good way of approaching it. And I think that there's a lot of things that people, no matter how good you get as a painter, the, the core competencies and the, the basic things, which, which build everything else is built upon, they are one of the most important things. If you don't base coat the model properly, you like you have problems later on. If that yeah, makes sense, yeah. if you don't. You know, so if you don't undercoat, prime it, or whatever, blah blah, it causes problems later on, etc. So like, it's a, it's a really good approach that you've you've almost like found the market gap by moving away from what everyone is subjected subjugated to essentially all day long. I think long. you've kind of, I think it's discredited as well as being like beginner focused, mm. just because it's simpler or a bit more like fundamental. But I think even for myself, like something I'm trying to make a conscious effort to do more lately is being someone who grew up in this like Instagram generation of like, everything's got to be amazing. I really struggle when painting my own stuff to not paint it to a ridiculous degree, which obviously yeah. means that it doesn't get done. Yeah. So I tried yeah. to start an army. I'm like, I'm gonna have my own army, but I spent so long painting the models. I got like five done in a year <laughs> yeah, and it yeah. wasn't feasible. <laughs> yeah. But that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a real it's metric. A <laughs> it's evidence online. But like within that, like find having access to like tutorials and stuff like that as well. If you're just going to like start an arm, like just because you're, once you've like accomplished that and you're comfortable in it, I don't think you have to necessarily move on and necessarily have to get better just for the sake of it. Yeah. Like a lot of people just enjoy painting to that level because it's a lot less pressure and, you know, it's more accessible and there's, it's easier to get things done and you're going to see results quicker as well. Um, where do you see like your content going forward of your own channel like in that regard? So, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about that. I mean, I get a lot of comments saying it's been tier level, which is fine because it's designed, not designed for the person that says that, which is, you know, it's fine. I've, I've always experienced that over the years anyway. And I look at some of my content and like the Space Marine one I did recently, which was like some fundamentals of painting in general, but I use Space Marines as a canvas. Like, because the cameras are so good, they, they zoom in quite close so you can see all the floors but i'm happy to show all the floors because that's part of for me the painting process when i'm painting certainly from an army point of view that i make a lot of mistakes early on but i tied him up later on mm -hmm. um and any mistakes i make i tend to not be so bothered about it and just like made a mistake it, the white on his eye was a bit too much i'll just tie that later up mm -hmm. but i like to show those mistakes because i think it 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 reinforces that everyone can make mistakes but being in the stores you'd see like kids like get really upset or het up because they've got like a bit of black from the gun on the hand they're like oh no i'm like dude it's fine it's it painting. It. you can literally paint over that black it's fine and once you start showing that kind of like cool not stressed kind of thing it, it i think it helps other people seeing that and they kind of like riff off that as well going yeah oh, we just made a load of mistakes and didn't seem bothered by it. Oh, because normally if I made that mistake, I'd dip it in like a load of like gunk to get rid of the paint yeah. and start from scratch. Because I think everyone thinks that it has to be a perfect line mm -hmm. from the off because a lot of the videos nowadays, when you see them, have been edited that way because they don't want to show the mistakes yeah. because it does look awful. But I think showing that awful side of it, the ugly stage, um, is quite fun. And I look back at some of the videos I've done, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Those eyes were a bit messy. I could have probably been a bit neat with it. But with the content going forwards, um, I definitely want to do more next step kind of stuff because I kind of did that when I was with um, Pat when we were doing like the um, like guides. They'll be like, here's tabletop and then here's a few things to, to take to the next step. And a lot of people said, oh, we'd like to see like your painting at the higher end kind of stuff. I'm like, well, I suppose there's an education in that as well that, you know, where do you go from this basic level or intermediate level? What, mm -hmm. What's the next steps to, to get up to those places where you can become like a, a Duncan or a Richard Gray or whatever? So, I think that shows a great sense of like responsibility as well and like taking ego out of it, I think is really mm -hmm. important because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are afraid to show those mistakes or like the messy stage of a model because just yeah. because of their own like, their own skin in the game, I guess, because people yeah. don't really want yeah. others to see them in that way because it's like, Almost if you're the one making the content, you're like, well, I know I'm capable of not making those mistakes. So I don't want other people to think that that's yeah. where I'm at. But I yeah. think it's really important for you to show those mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have got a lot from that, um, from the comments going, oh my God, it's because they, they make those, those mistakes and don't know how to fix them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, that, and they, I, they're, they're like guaranteed if you're a beginner, especially yeah, like yeah. you are going to make mistakes. So it's unfair to show someone something that like is not a realistic reflection on what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, oh. do you know what it's right? I'll say, do you, do you know one of the things that's really, really interesting and, and nods directly to what you're saying? When we, when we do classes and we, when I do physical painting classes or whether we do online or whatever, blah, blah, um, 
one of the things that often comes up is when I watch it, people say to me, when I watch a YouTube video, you don't see that part or you don't see that that's been done or you yeah. don't see that blah, blah, blah. You don't see those things. So one of the real virtues of what you're doing, what you're doing is that you're showing, as you put it, like the ugly side and all those parts, how mm. to fix them. So you're kind of filling the gap of like, there's YouTube stuff out there that you see the progress of, of, of a miniature. You see the lovely finished model and the rotation at the end and maybe the, the hook picture of it at the beginning, whatever. And you see the selective parts to get you from the front bit through to the end and see it again. Mm. On classes, people go, oh, well, you can't stop a YouTube video and ask that part or see that part, or maybe that bit hasn't been shown. Or they yeah. go, I just apply the black to all the model and you put that bit yeah. on. And then all the black's suddenly on, but you yeah. don't see the cleanup that's been done because the person slipped here or done this. I mean, yeah. a pristine blocked in black model or like all the pouches are done in brown or whatever, blah, blah. So I think that approach is really, really good. And I think it, it, you're quite right. It gets rid of that, that fear of making a mistake because it's almost like the way socials are now, you put stuff up and it's like keeping up with the Joneses. Mm. It's like, oh, do you see they've got new blinds? Or oh, we, need, we, we, need, we need to get new yeah, blinds. Yeah. Or like, oh, do you see they've just painted that model and they've done NMM on all the trim and all the things. Oh, I've, I've got to do some NMM now because I've got, I've got to get that online and show that I can do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. You also yeah. kind of see that with like the techniques. Like there was a brief window. I think it's not as bad as it, I don't think it's as bad now as it has been in the past, but there was just kind of this like phase where like, all the YouTubers are trying to come up with this new like gimmick of the week of like yeah, yeah, this yeah. method is how you paint the best in the least amount of time. No, this method. Is how yeah, you paint the yeah. best in the least amount of time. I've been called out on that a few times because uh, I can't remember what I said. It was a while back, and I was I came up with a, a statement, a um, reverse highlight, and that was it. I'd, I'd sprayed uh, a Sentinel silver, washed it, and then I just filled in all the areas, but didn't go to the edges so it looked chipped and battered. I saw that. that uh, I thought that was, I thought that just, was genius. <laughs> I saw what I learned from workshop just to get like real quick ways of like getting armoured like for orcs and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. You, you, you spray it all silver, yeah, you wash yeah. it, you dry brush it, then you fill in the colour but don't go to the edges. And it was just like, Jonesy used to call it reverse highlight. I was like, I like that. And then someone's like, I hope you're not starting a new, um, a new trend. method or trend like <laughs> slap chop. I'm like, no, it's just... I'm not highlighting. I'm doing the reverse of that. Yeah. So I'll call it reverse highlighting. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else you I, would I, say. I, I, Just to I, clarify my stance on that, I don't think it's a bad thing that people no. are trying to innovate or like come up with new ideas. I don't but think you're that right. those exercises are worthwhile because for all you know, you could have done that and it would have turned out amazing or it didn't work. And the only way you know that is by experimentation. So I think experimentation is important, but I don't like the idea of trying Gimmicks. to sell people a bit of a lie, which is why yeah. I like the idea of like showing the mistakes and things yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, you're right. There was a, a trend of like, uh, certainly after on the back of the slap shop, everyone was like trying to do different things and stuff. And I think that's why the community were like, oh, I hope you're not trying a new one. Because hmm. I think people got bored of it. And it was just like, it was just too much. Yeah. But really it's quite, it's, it just, that whole technique, again, there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. And I just want to caveat that before I get loads of fire in the comments. But like, <laughs> but, but the, I think the thing is, is like, that has always been around. It's just, it's, it's got a new name applied to it. And yeah. uh, truth be told, Rob's video was, was, was great. Like yeah. his approach, the sort of like real sort of like a funny kind of way of approaching it, all that kind of stuff was brilliant. Um, but it, it's all it for me is, it, it is, is what that video done and that technique coming to the forefront again. Is it just, I think it was actually really helpful because it, it made a lot of people go, oh, actually I can just do that and I still get yeah. decent models, you know? Yeah. So the delivery of the new fad or whatever you want to call it is, is all well and good. But it's the fact that something comes to the forefront and people go, oh, actually, I can, I yeah. can actually apply that and get half decent results, yeah. which is, which is the thing. I feel like also the slap chop thing, it's kind of withstood enough time to not be a fad anymore. Yeah, yeah, maybe. yeah. yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, no, yeah. I don't think we call that a fad now. No, no. Yeah. Still, people are still talking. It's about just given it a name, still, doing it. I yeah, do yeah. think that was the spawn of that kind of thing. Yeah, like, yeah. I think people were trying to chase people, the next. People were like, chop. oh, I want my, I want to come up with my one of them. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but the actual slap. No, I wasn't. Thing I wasn't stipulating like, that it's a fad. I was just saying the new. That's what the new one. The new thing would be. Called, yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah, but yeah. I just want to caveat that again. Fire in the comments. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it was just going back a little bit. I think it was like interesting that you you touched on showing the mistakes and things like that because one of the main things that we wanted to always make sure if when we were starting this podcast was make sure that obviously people have a certain we show off the models that we show off and they're all like very high quality and we pride ourselves on that. And that is for a while, all anyone had seen from this company. Yeah, like yeah. we would just post out the finished models that yeah. looked great. I'm a bit biased, but they look great. <laughs> they do. Um, <laughs> and that's all that people saw. So I think one of the biggest surprises people have when they start listening to this podcast is how open we are about our personal hobby mistakes mm. yeah. and, and our, how things really make us feel and yeah, yeah. and what we did to avoid this sort of thing. 
I do think that uh, it's sort of echoing what you said, where you've seen a lot of people in your comments liking that element of it. We definitely get that as well. Yeah, it's clearly yeah. something that people are looking for. I think people want honesty. Yeah, it's yeah. All, uh, there's there's been a many years where it's always been like this untouchable thing that you you can't. Like, oh, I'd love to be able to do that, but I can't do that. And no one would tell you how to get to that. It was always like you'd ask questions. They'd be like, oh, no. It's, it was, even Workshop was terrible for that. Like, we'd never discuss the magic. When Heavy Metal went to events, they couldn't talk about how they painted. When Sculptors went to events, they couldn't talk about how they sculpted. I was like, why? It's like, because it, it like, ruins the magic. It's like, it's not magic, though, is it? It's just a skill. <laughs> I There's love no the magic. idea of like, oh, if only Darren Latham had spoken to me and told me, <laughs> then I'd be able to do it. <laughs> like, that's all. That's the only missing piece. Big news, tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024. For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. What a lot of those like uh, YouTube trends kind of skip over as well is like there's, as someone watching those videos on the other side of it, for a lot of things, there is no shortcut for practice. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. And yeah. that's something that's often overlooked. Like people are, especially when people are so time limited and there's this weird obsession with time in this hobby as a whole, which I guess is a broader conversation, but yeah, a lot of people are trying to sort of shortcut everything. Yeah. And like in this, James calls it like the, the Amazon. A Amazon of miniature painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like there isn't. There isn't. Yeah. Dope, unfortunately, sorry to break 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 the flow, but there is no instant gratification when it comes to miniature painting. Like we are, I'm going to say this in the most biased way, but Siege is the most closest thing to Amazon, except you don't get it next day. You know, like it takes <laughs> well, a lot longer you, than that. You know, so if you buy one of the pre painted ones on the store, oh, you yeah, might yeah. get it close to next there day. Is, but not, there, maybe there not is, maybe not next day. Yeah, that's a, that was yeah. a great plug, Joe. Yeah. yeah like, <laughs> but, but I've yeah. been doing it 40 episodes in. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> 40 episodes. Yeah, yeah, it's you crazy. Crazy. So this yeah. is 41. It's 41. Oh, yeah. 41. Yeah. 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 So, but, but yeah, no, I, th I think that's one of the things like time is something that like, you're quite right. It's that is potentially a whole other topic to talk about, in a, you know, in another episode potentially, or, you know, a bit more in this one. But, but I think there is that thing where it's like, you see, only, you only see the best online. You're not, you don't realize how many hours have gone into it. You, you, you see that post go up by a person you follow, you instantly, you like it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You're captivated by it, whatever. But none of the story behind that, none of the trials and tribulations, none of those things that have gone into it. But you wouldn't like, it, it's so strange as well, because you wouldn't go on Instagram, see someone who's like absolutely shredded, like an incredible shape bodybuilder, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then go to the gym twice and when you're think, overweight and be like, why don't I look like him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah That's yeah. exactly what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I started the gym and I was like, it's broken. It's not working. I don't know. Yeah. I don't understand. It's, it's, it's not for me. Really. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, playing on? the game of like, well, if I just had the dumbbells he used, yeah. then I would look like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If that's that's spoke yeah. to me at an event. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's almost like what paintbrush do you use? I'm going to go and buy fifty. You know, like, you know. So, yeah, like I, I think that I think a lot more realness and like actually you know, revealing the, the 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 graft, which is if you want to call it anything, the graft that goes behind whether it's painting high end, whether it's producing a consistent army, whether it's getting an army done for a tournament in a, in a short time frame. Like, I think that's one of the things that needs to be vocalised, needs to be seen more in our industry. Being frank, like there's too much where you 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 get a five minute video and you see at the beginning amazing, and you go through segmented sections that are curated to show some sort of flow without showing any of the nuances that go there. And I think it's quite quite human to just say, well, look, I put this color on and it didn't layer the way that I thought it was going to layer. So I had to take that off. Like no one's going to go, oh, you're crap. You know, yeah, like, no, yeah, one's gonna, yeah. like, no one's going to say yeah. that, you know, maybe if they're sitting at a computer with a keyboard and not in person, but like, but, but yeah, for me, I think that like it, it just, it adds a sense of normality to it, which yeah. I think a lot of stuff out there doesn't have you know um well speaking of time so i just wanted to dive in a bit more with something you said earlier about how you really enjoy the army painting stuff for your personal hobby so we've spoken a lot on the show about like getting the most enjoyment and just doubling down on the things you actually like doing yeah so what is it about or i guess we can get more specific what is the things that you actually like really enjoy painting so i, th I think it's the spectacle that's uh, the thing i always go for like with when when i've done like the odd character in the past it's quite cool i'll paint a character up and you know that then goes in the shelf, but then what do I do with that? I've got mm. a character. 
Whereas having an army, it seems to have a function. It's got an overall look to it. It's like the spectacle of it. And when certainly I was really into army painting, there was always that kind of, you're painting to a level that makes, it's not like that squad's really good or that squad's really good. It's that that army looks really good. And you're painting to that, if that makes sense. You're not like trying to make each of them like amazing. You're trying to make the army look amazing. And a lot of that is through like the basin, the color choice, flags. Yeah. really love flags flags on on the units just looks amazing um and that was always the thing that used to so i, I suppose as well my my big thing with like painting armies would be I'd, I'd have like a certain size i'd aim for like i don't know like 1500 points or like a couple of regiments a couple of characters a vehicle or something and then i'd play games with it and that then inspires me to do the next couple of squads and then the next couple of squads and, I, and that was like the driving force would be like i'd have an idea of an army I'd go and do it and then I'd play some games and get really excited about it and do some more stuff. Not to like win the meta or anything like that. I was just like, oh, you know, I need, I need more tanks because that was fun. I really like what the tank did. Um, and one of the things I've, I've, I've never really thought about it until now, but I've never copied a color scheme from the box. I've always put my own stamp on it. And I even though I did the dwarf video recently, I was looking at all the dwarfs and I was like, no, those dwarfs look like the stuff from the box packaging. I've never copied the box packaging. Mm. Why is that? Um, and I still don't know the answer, but what I do know, and we talked about it earlier, is like you look at the stuff on the front of the boxes, you think they're really good. I can, I'll never be able to get to that level. I think by never copying the box cover, ne- I never get that feeling because it would never look like the box content anyway because it's a completely different color scheme it's like yeah you're not trying to imitate the yeah. box color scheme so you're more okay with what you end up with. so the psychology like, is just my yeah. thing that i'm doing it's yeah. A thing. yeah there is no barbecue basically. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 it's <laughs> my it's my own take on it and yeah. i've just done my own thing i think there's been once or twice when i've done stuff for work uh, but then that has been because we created that color scheme anyway so like you know yeah. if we're like doing like the empire we're doing stuff for the box packaging for the empire but like let's just paint them instead of blue and sorry red and white let's paint them blue and red let's do Altdorf instead of Talibaheim sick and sick and tired of seeing Talibaheim let's do Altdorf like, why are we doing Altdorf because that's who Carl Franz works with <laughs> so, he's so, like the main character <laughs> I, I'm so glad you said that about like playing doing, creating a bit of a force and then like and then playing some games with it and then making some additions or changes or things mm. like that based off that so I used to game quite a lot I don't anymore I, I what with work and obviously just with a bit of painting and stuff that I do I don't really get to do uh, like a lot of gaming and I've kind of culled that in my hobby because it, it, I personally, for me, and this is a whole other topic that I don't really, I don't get, I don't, I like something tangible for the time of invested person. Me, that's yeah. just the way I look at it. Um, but what I used to do when I was gaming is me, my friends, my, I used to go to like Warhammer World, used to go to like a couple of gaming clubs and stuff like that. Um, and we used to basically have an army or whatever and something would happen in a game for example like your sergeant would charge an enemy unit and like all these men would get cut down and he'd get wounded or something like that blah blah and you'd make some story up that would then lead to create another character within your army that represents him further on in the path or something like that so having that kind of like that story aspect of your army adding things in because this happened in this you know thing that i think that when you overlay that aspect of it from the gaming side and like create some really cool models or things or add some a certain skull to the base of this character because he killed an orc, orc war boss in combat or something like that. I think stuff like that adds so much, so much to to, to an overall force composition as in what it looks like as an army. And irrelevant of where, where it's painted to, whether everything is every metal or everything is just basically done so you can get it gaming. You mentioned basing, which is something that I'm, I'm trying to lead on to, which is obviously that adds a whole swathe of interest and yeah. detail to miniatures as well. And really, I, I always say this, and this is kind of getting close to the fiery topic, but we're getting lower on the, on the model, don't worry. But, um, but the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the, the base for me, people always say like faces and bases and yeah. exactly you mentioned faces earlier. Yeah, instinctively, it's the first thing a human eye recognizes because of from birth, your parents, et cetera, blah, blah. But like the the base and theme and that is essentially the frame and the environment and the story yeah. that 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 model is within so adding a decent one of those onto the base you read a rim color for the minute <laughs> is is really really part of making a full army look great when it's all together yeah. i find yeah. like i think that's a huge part of it um so one of your what's, what what is one of your favorite armies is it eventually in nobles oh god yeah i think so i th- I, I think that was more down to um Imperial Guard to me for one forty thousand that that they started moving into the realms of like modern day warfare mm-hmm. and as cool as they look, I always remember them being quite 
outlandish with their color schemes and their outfits and stuff to the point that it was almost like Napoleonics in space. I know, obviously, Earth is in space before mm-hmm. someone says that in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you get what I mean. Um, so you'd have like, at least from the old art, you'd have like ranks and ranks and ranks of, of like guardsmen that might have ostentatious outfits. Some might be more practical, but yeah. they've got like the two banners. So if you take the old classic Imperial Guard box set, it's like the Necromund and Spiders. They're all marching in line. And they've got like a couple of officers in front. They've got all these banners and it looks amazing. Granted, their outfits aren't like Napoleonic, but it's the style of fighting mm-hmm. that they do. And when I was, it was a oh, battle force challenge. We we're given a battle force each. And I was like, oh, I like, I, I'm an astromanic time guard. I want to do something different. I'd already been doing an empire army. And I was like, let's just swap the heads. And then add some really outlandish, because I'm just going to make a Napoleonic army, but you know, for, for one of 40,000. And it was weird because I was really enjoying it and I started, I, I really liked the idea of doing just, again, this is like quick hacks for painting armor. It's like paint it black and gloss it. Mm. You get nice lacquer, but on its own, it looks a bit naff unless you do a little bit of gold trim around it. That seems to help tie it and gives it that kind of Baroque armor kind of feel. So I gave him that, gave him like magenta robes. I was like doing a color scheme when the, the new colors came out because we at the time we had a glazed blood letter over certain magentas looked really nice. I was doing that. Great paint that. It was a great paint. Then they got rid of it. <laughs> Bad idea. Um, <laughs> But I found another way of painting them, which is fine. And then before I knew it, it, it was like, we want to put that in the army book. We want to get some art for it. And I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> what? This is weird. Um, but I did notice that they put it right near like the buffet zone of like the Tyranids. So I assume at some point it'll get eaten. <laughs> um, so uh, like, well, in case he leaves, let's stick it over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I slipped oh, in the high no. five. <laughs> All the <laughs> <bank> <laughs> trillions are dead. Oh. But yeah. Um, I've got an idea. I'm not going to go too much in it because I've got to try and work out how to do it. But I want to try and get a gateway from 40k to Napoleonics for for my audience. And the way to do that is to use Napoleonics because um, I've been putting like Marines next to the Perry the um, Perry miniatures, and they kind of size quite well from a, a like a Space Marine versus a human size. And I'm like, can I just get loads of like Perry miniatures, paint them as 40k troops, give them banners, but play black powder games using Napoleonics? Paint them as 40k regiments, but still play Napoleonics, but making it 40k. So that's, I've got a, that's, yeah. the, that's the best hybrid ever, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a whole idea of like how I want to do the video. I want to pitch it, maybe do some battle reports and stuff like that. But it, it's also to show that it's model agnostic. You can literally go, I want my Imperial Guard to be different than the Canyons. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, and obviously, size wise, because of scale creep, Perry miniatures or Victrix or like Warlord games will be different in scale yeah, yeah. to Cadians. But if you just kept it within that scale, I mean, yeah, you can play in official tournaments. But if you're like me and don't care about that, then it's up to you. <laughs> Fair, yeah. Um, but yeah, I favorite have a army. Fun little uh, little idea for a game. Almost, I've just come up with. So okay, okay. Okay, he looks very proud of himself. Uh, it's gonna be uh, good. Right, so <laughs> is, is it not? It's not purge. Is it? No, no, no. no, no okay. No, no. All right. So we do these little occasional little game show segments. This isn't okay. quite a full beans game show, but I thought it would be quite fun. So. I've proposed the idea of in the spirit of enjoyment. I want to know what would be your ideal hobby day. So Ooh. say you've got like a free weekend, like, you know, yeah. no kids, no, no responsibilities. Nothing Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is so rare, but yeah. <laughs> so I want to know what it is you're painting at what stage in the process are you at? So like the bit that you find the most fun. So they might already all be base coated. They yeah, might yeah, be shaded, yeah. et cetera. And what's on in the background? Have you got like an audio book on oh, like a movie or something? Like this that? is good. So I, I'm going to go out there. I'm, I'm not just going to be painting. I'm going to be starting from scratch. I'm going to be building an entire uh, force. Uh, maybe let's say uh, a, a new Warcry board with two new Warcry warbands. The day's going to start off with all those in plastic sprues. They're going to be cut up. They're going to be converted. And then by, oh, we're talking a weekend. Yeah, I've got two days, right? Full weekend. Full weekend. Yeah, full weekend. weekend. I'm sure yeah, we can yeah. stretch the bank holiday. Yeah, yeah. No, no, bank holiday. Three, three days. days. Three yeah. days. Yeah. So, so there's one coming up. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. I'm loving this. So in this three days, I'm, I'm watching all the, the Hobbit movies and all the Lord of the Rings movies back to back. Because um, I always find like, because certain films or certain like, um, trilogies or whatever you can just have in the background and not look at yeah, yeah. your mind's eyes yeah. filling you Especially in if you've yeah. seen them and you know so them. much yeah. five million times yeah. <laughs> not to derail you too much but how do you go about that with your setup do you have it on like a like a ipad screen or do you have like a big tv and you bring your uh, desk i've got like my so by my desk i've got my little my pc with its uh, monitor and stuff so i'll be like doing a lot of the building there and then i've got like a little spare desk work and then start doing the scenery and stuff but yeah there's a lot of scenery i want to get open and crack and, and start converting and doing like some new war cry wall bands and, and boards so that would be my ideal 
weekend. And th- thank you, Mrs. Peach, for taking the kid out for three days. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> and they'll all be painted by the end of the weekend as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's I thought, I, I was expecting when pitching that, that we'd be like finishing something off maybe later <laughs> in the process. We're going to yeah, we're gonna gonna kick start something it. off. Well, I was going to say, yeah, mine would be literally planning a project not, not actually having to do it the thought of having to fit a full project into three days it seems like a nightmare to no, me no that's so, what i'm saying so it's your ideal like dream scenario right so for me for example if i was doing this i would i would my ideal hobby day is i've already done all the prep so like this is like the best bit yeah so okay, my yeah, marines yeah. they're already base coated i've already done like, the first stage of highlights so i'm into the details i'm going in oh, all, all seven can, all uh, seven of them yeah, <laughs> yeah all, seven of them. all seven marines of my army yeah. i can uh biggest actually, army to date yeah. i can lead you into your next debate with my official answer oh come like. on, go on go come for it uh, so my official answer would be i've painted everything it's all fine okay. and i'm just now having to do the base rim oh cool, so, oh, cool. So i'm yeah. gonna crack out Vallejo 950 black, the <gasps> colour that base rim should be black, and I'm going to do all the base rims. Right, come I'm on in. Roll, 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 roll your sleeves up, come on. Queens be rolls. Yeah, no, um, come on then, let's get this one done. So this all started, you were very, very kind to invite me down when, we, when you were um, painting phase, and obviously mm. I came on we, and we spoke about base rims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had a really good conversation about it, and you, you tabled brown base rims, and I said, I prefer black because I think it looks like a picture frame, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Plus also if you touch it and the paint rubs off, you just see black base shit. Yeah, yeah. I nearly had you at that point because you were like, <laughs> you were like, I could, and you were like, Bub for Brown. I was like, damn. But <laughs> we then kind of like had a group conversation on one of the episodes and then it just kind of went a bit nuts. Like, um, yeah, the- uh, Cake was involved. Cake, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want, yeah, don't bring up- cake analogy. Everyone was so mad don't about the cake. Bring up it the was cake. not a great analogy. I'm sorry, all right? I don't know what to tell you. I worst, thought it made sense in my head. Worst analogy ever. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so I thought it would be great on this episode to reignite the fires of fury in talking about the proverbial black or brown base. Yeah, 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 I like it. Well, so, I've, got, I've got some port, support, I think, this time. Yes, yeah, I think, it's 2v2 yeah. yeah. this time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you know what, though? I've only just, I know I've just sort of brought this up and really ramped it up, but we said we were going to do it anyway. But yeah. <laughs> the I've only just got, it's been enough time since we spoke about it that I, I feel like I can paint other base rooms. Yeah. For a while, yeah. I felt like I should only paint black base rooms because I've said this and I've, I've stood by it. Well, and similar to the sub-assembly thing, <laughs> people, especially George, pulling me up on it <laughs> every time. So now it's been long enough. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can get away with not painting yeah. black base rooms if I want to now. People aren't necessarily remembering about it. We've put that to bed. And now we're going to light that fire again. Yeah. And I'm now going to have to paint black base rooms for the rest of my well, life. I, I've painted a, v- a variety of base rooms in my, in my time. Uh, I've done black a few times and I found that they are really good for board games. Mm-hmm. So when I've done like Underworlds or Silver Tower or whatever, it kind of feels like it's part of the board game. It's mm-hmm. weird. Um, and before that, I used to do green, goblin green rims for the old sort nice. of like flock at the top and stuff like that. And the brown rim, the brown rim was the winner for me for a multitude of reasons. Doesn't mean it's right. Oh no, there's it, no right it's, or wrong. It's, 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 it's what works for oh, me. now there's no right or wrong. We get Pichu on the show and all of a sudden there's no right or wrong. It is right. <laughs> <laughs> and th- th- there's a couple of reasons. One, we used to, when I was in the studio, everything was rimmed the same. And there was two reasons for that. One, it looked visually pleasing on the photography um, because black was just too harsh. It was kind mm. of a jump and it was the same for like on boards as well. And as an army painter and gamer, um, I've done like greys and like dark greens and I've done black and it's kind of like really jarring to my eyes when I've got mm. the army on the table whereas the the brown that we, we settled on originally was great graveyard earth and it went steel legion drab um, was a little bit more subtle and it could work with any sort of terrain type so if like I'm playing with my army that's on a desert board and they've got like brown yeah, sort yeah. of soil with grass with like the steel legion drab rim it looks fine then if I move on to a city it looks fine it's less jarring mm. so from that kind of point of view um, that's why I've always done it brown. But there's also another reason why we always did it brown in the studio. And that's because you can change it to any color in Photoshop. So if you put like my Stormcast Eternals, which I've got like a gray sort of surface of soil and they've got a brown rim, you put that on a snowboard, you can easily with your curves and your, like, your, your uh, luminetrics change it to white. Oh, right. You can't do that with black or it's a lot harder. You have to yeah, mask yeah, everything yeah, off. Them. 
Um, and then it's a lot harder for the um, the graphic designers. So the graphic designers are always like, can you make it brown, please? Because it's really easy oh, right. to, to So fix. it's the graphic designer's fault this yeah. whole time. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a mutual yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were like no problem there. That's yeah. what I prefer anyway. but they, they could literally turn it to black grey yeah, yeah. that makes, that makes of, perfect sense yeah, so yeah, yeah. Does yeah. Make sense. I'm still painting black yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean like, even now I've got like some that are painted black because they yeah. use them for, for board games so yeah, yeah, like no, my totally. Shatterpoint or I do, the... it does fit what you're saying though because I particularly into Underworlds at the minute mm. Maybe that's one of the reasons that I've gravitated towards it is that my black base rims fit in a bit better. Don't yeah. go, don't yeah. go to the darkness. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't. Do right, it. See, my take for it, if we're dialing back to our episode from a while ago, cake, cake. Yeah. <laughs> about cake. Burned my peachy. Yeah. So going back to my cake analogy, you know, the, the reason what I said was everyone slated me as like team brown base room. That wasn't it. What I said was it should be painted to match whatever the basing scheme is, mm. which oftentimes is like generic, like dirt, grass, tufts, yeah, all that yeah. sort of thing, which is why the Steel Legion drab makes sense, works for most things. But I did also say, if it's like a black scheme or dark or, or gray, go for that. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It just, I suppose it depends on people's own personal boards and uh, their setups. Like if they've only got like a gray city fight, then it makes sense to do everything gray, yeah. right? But then if you go around to your mates and they're on a, like a jungle, it just looks a bit weird. If you enjoyed this episode of Paint Perspective, I just wanted to ask that you do us a huge favor by leaving a rating and review on whatever platform you're using and also choosing to follow and subscribe. It'd really help us out and it helps us deliver these episodes to you for free every week. Now back to the show. So I'm going to throw something in here because this Ooh. is something that we've not discussed on it before. And I think that it, it segues nicely and fits on. I've never understood having the models on transparent discs. Oh yeah. So, on so, that. so I get the, I, I kind of understand that you can take it anywhere and it matches yeah, yeah, the board, yeah. et cetera, yeah. but it just looks odd to me. I don't know about that. There's something about putting a, a basing me material or something on the base yeah. and putting tufts on it and painting it and adding like skulls on it and all that kind of stuff that for me is like part of the finishing process. Yeah. Yeah. So to just spend hours painting the model, as nice as you want to paint it for the level you want to paint it for the, whatever the army's going to look like. And then you put it on, just glue it to a transparent disc. What about, Oh God. <laughs> what about when they're like certain GW models, for example, drones, and yeah, things tower come, drones come with mind. transparent discs. Are you, uh, would you still base them? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, tower drones yeah. frustrate me because they're not the right. They haven't got that thick. Like there's no, you can't base rim. Yeah, yeah. One of those. Yeah. So yeah. it's like a weird, like, you could leave it clear, but you could also not leave it clear. But if you don't leave it clear, it's not quite a base. Yeah. So so it's just them, about a dirt base. Do you know what you need? You need a five mil drill bit and a dewarf. <laughs> oh, and you drill through the middle of a base and put the flight stand in a normal base, 25 mil, 28.5 potentially. But yeah, you put, you, put it, you, you put it in one of those. And then you can have... Yeah, actually, I've seen people do that before yeah, where they yeah. put the, the drones... Right, I'm going to... The they sometimes come with them. <laughs> it's triggered, here yeah. we go. Sometimes a tower drone comes with a proper base. Sometimes, yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think I, I prefer drones and things like that. Like any like little friends, let's put it that way. I prefer them on, on actual, bases. actual bases rather yeah. than being on things. But yeah, I just, I've just, I remember going to a tournament once and, um, and I was playing somebody and like they just got out of their army and the army was stunning, like beautiful army. But I was like, they're all on like just... Bits yeah. of perspex. I was like, I, I thought the kind of I get it totally because you put it on the table and it, and then the, bait, the table in. you're on it blends in and stuff. But it just, it just looks. Would a bit, that a bit make odd. more sense for board games potentially? The transparent thing. What the discs? Yeah. Well, see, even Space Hulk, even like the set, is it the second edition Space? No, it's not second. It's the third edition, isn't it? It's the Whichever one with the, the was, yeah, 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 the third edition. They, they had like. The Terminators had like squares of plastic. They didn't have a proper base, did they? They just had like, yeah. They almost had like bases built into the model. Model, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. so I wonder, yeah. if I, just because you said about black base rooms working really well with um with the board games, I wonder if like maybe there's a place for a transparent perspex in that regard. I just guess because you can like see the. I think you're even going to like the look of it or I've, not, though, with that. I've seen people it. where they get a printout of the actual, like, let's say, Silver Tower. They print out like some of the board sections and then put that on the base so it looks like it ties in, which is yeah, quite yeah. nice talking about the plastic base rooms i remember doing a, an eldar army um and we put it in the cabinet and we based the actual flying stands because it looked cooler because it then tied in with all the infantry and stuff it just visually looked better mm -hmm. even though they're like different shapes and i remember one of the exec walked through and he was just like aren't they clear it's supposed to be clear bases like yeah he's like why have you based them because it looks better why are we making them then if that's the case 
And I was like, I have no answer to Good that. Good point, yeah. And he was like, well, that's stupid because they cost a lot of money to make. And I was like, and if you're just going to base them, what's the point? And I was like, well, some people don't want to. And he was like, yeah, but that needs more looking into. So I guess if you see a lot of basing stuff nowadays, like the Astarte stuff, they tend to have like the curvy or whatever the stem, but it's on a normal base. Sure, or yeah, a normal yeah. base yeah. So I wonder if they've just like looked at that and gone, See, it's I, a waste the, of cash. The way I always look at it is like, I mean, obviously that, that I didn't know that, that point perspective of it, but I, I was I was literally just like, well, the drone is, if you've got an army on a terrain or like on, on, a, uh, on a world, like ice world or like whatever, blah, blah. Like if you've got an army on that environment, and I understand totally that drone or the, the falcon or the whatever it is that's on the flying stand is flying yeah, and there's yeah. nothing connecting it to the ground. I get that totally. But I think I find it looks stranger a random perspex complete object when everything else is like yeah, on agreed. an environment, it's like they somewhere else. Like, yeah. you know, so I think I asked why I, what I used to do is use the transparent flight stand, yeah. put it on normal base, yeah. base that so that that model is still unified with the rest of the army. Yeah. But it's similar no, that's to the like, way I'd do it. Yeah. Similar to like how some of the, like some of the tanks, I suppose it's only ever if they're flying like a repulsor or something, but they have bases now, don't they? Yeah, yeah I, start, they I started basing. Uh, I didn't at first because I thought it was stupid, but then uh, I started, I mean, it was like a space war farming. I, I ended up basing the attack bike because actually in comparison to the bikes, it looked stupid because the bikes are on like ovals at the time. They're on whatever the weird cavalry what base it was now. It's the oval. American football base. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, yeah. But it's like it needs to go on a, a round base because then it, it's the same height as the rest of it because it was always weird because you had like the, the bikes that were like at a certain height then the attack bike which was really lower because it didn't get a base and it just mm. used to I don't know trigger me in, in my own like, yeah. sort of like that doesn't look right and then ever since then I like I did a Gene Stiller Court Army all my bikes and my quad bike were on bases so I'm sticking all my trucks yeah. on bases I always well. I remember when I first started getting back into it and noticing that obviously a lot of the tanks at the time before primary so a lot of the tanks weren't on bases mm. and I always thought I don't know how much of a divisive topic this is if people have like particularly strong feelings on it but <laughs> I, I was like will. I will. was like shouldn't they just have bases still I get they're a big model yeah. but it'd be cool to have like a rhino on a base I don't know why that's not you know what's thing. really weird like the older editions of 40k it would have made more sense then for them to have them on bases because then you can easily work out really fire rocks. Yeah, the yeah. fire rocks and stuff like that is that one of those things though where it's like if you do it for that you got to do it for everything and then all of a sudden you've got like that's what I'm saying yeah do one it for meter long well, I was just bases saying, for a wall you, 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 pretty yeah. much, you pretty much need a pizza board for a land raider so like it's like it's like it's a massive kit isn't it and then like obviously you'd have, you need the surround to do the basing actually around it but I I that's the bit where I'm a little bit divisive on it because, like, I agree that like drones and all those things sh personally should have like the basin on the on the flight stands mm. or, or like a base that's a normal base or whatever. But I remember seeing a rhino put on like one of those night bases before, yeah, and it, just looked, it looked weird. It just looked really odd, like, yeah, and yeah. I understand totally, like, because everything else is based and it kind of like it's a bit of an oxymoron with what I was saying about the the, the drone or the falcon or whatever, blah blah. But I just think it looks weird. I don't know, like. It does open you up to kind of making the basing more of a part of the model, though, doesn't Correct, it? If, yeah. if the base is substantial enough, I'm not talking about with like the repulse or whatever, because yeah. it's a tiny little thing, but if the base was like more substantial, you could potentially have like crew on foot or like, you know, maybe like yeah. a, tr a track has like come off or something, like a diorama. mini diorama. Yeah. Or yeah, like, yeah. I think like the field ordnance battery, uh, yeah. the yeah. new uh, Cadian things, like almost doing that, but like with the tank or something. Yeah, really yeah cool. no, totally. Yeah. yeah. I just remember the first, very first time I saw, I think it was in a white dwarf. I opened it and there was just like this, this rhino on like a dinner plate. And I was like, why is it on a base? Yeah. But, it, but do you know what it is? I think it's through seeing tanks without bases for like 20 years, like in white dwarf or wherever you go, just with no bases and all of a sudden just seeing one on the base. It's yeah, like the that's weird, probably a lot of it. It's weird just getting over it. Yeah, yeah no, being, totally. No, I, I mean, that's yeah. it. I, I had the same reaction when I saw it the first time and then I'm okay <laughs> with it now, which yeah, is yeah. weird. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So what advice would you give to somebody if they're going to paint their first army? So they're, maybe they're painting like Underworlds, uh, sort of war bands or Warcry war bands or Necromunda gang or something like that. Like what for you makes sort of like the painting process for a an army? What what things would you recommend somebody who's literally just like, oh, I've painted like five models. I want to paint 50 or like yeah, yeah. 60. What, what Can would I you... just extrapolate on that before you answer it as well? Maybe potentially even what is it about big army projects for you that doesn't scare you? Because I know a lot of people would think like smaller is better myself personally i always want to be painting like single figures but you said you enjoy yeah. the the mass of it all so what is it about having so many models that doesn't scare you i suppose because that's quite intimidating for a lot of people yes i mean that you know, there is a discipline required to to work your way through a unit of 20 a night or something like that but um i think the biggest thing i would always say is and it, it, 
there's a date there is a bit of a danger here as well uh is to do a test model always do a test model it's something i i get a lot of feedback on when i'm doing like my one-to-ones or chatting to people about the hobby is the first question i always say is did you do a test and they're like no and that's usually why your army ends up being a bit of a, a a car crash because you start painting everything at the same point. So there's been a few people that have been, let's say they've been doing gray nights and they painted their 30 figures. They sprayed it silver, then they put the wash on it and then they did the gold and now it's not working. I'm like, D- did you do one to completion first? And they're like, no, that's probably why you're having to do all this extra work now. Cause once you start making those mistakes, you have to then correct all those mistakes on 30 figures. So I always think do a test model. The problem with doing the test model is you always want to put more effort into it. So then it gives you a bit of a, <laughs> sort of a jarring end result. But the thing with the test model, it does two things for me is it, I know where all the colors are going. I know the process, but then what I can do is extrapolate things for sort of speed and efficiency. So I'll look at the test model and I'll go, you know what, actually I sprayed this originally gray. It's actually gonna be a lot easier if I spray it silver. Mm. Um, and that's going to cut out like hours of work if I spray it silver because all I'm doing is picking out the gold here and then picking out some red here, picking out some black here. Why did I start off with grey? That's a really weird <laughs> choice. Um, so that's the great thing about doing a test model. You can look at that and make those choices. But then from like doing big armies, don't go as go go mad. Mm. You know, you can you can cut corners. You don't have to like on a test model you want to highlight the belts you want to highlight avoid highlighting the belts i know it's one figure um and it, you're looking at the figure going but it needs highlighting but then when you put it arm's length and then you've got another 10 guys around you're like oh that looks cool it doesn't matter <laughs> i didn't highlight the belts um so I, I do think the test model is key but it can cause issues uh, and nowadays because i've got the confidence i tend to test model the unit champion because i always put a bit more effort into the test model I, I, I know that sounds like really bad, like, oh, I don't make mistakes, but I know roughly in my mind's eye, because I've got the experience of it, I can I can visualize what it looks like. So chances are my mistakes will be minimal and I can easily correct them, but my sergeant will look mega. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the rest of the guys around it will be, you know, I'll cut the corners on those where needs be because usually the sergeant's the, la- the last guy left alive. I was hoping that you were going to finish with that because like, you put so much of it to one more. Everyone dies around him. He's like, it's got more highlights. It's closer than me. I'm, I'm next. It's yeah. like the red shirt in Star Trek. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, like that. it's like that. It's a bit of a meme, but it's like, oh, he had a better gaming chair than me. <laughs> <laughs> Did, uh, so we've spoke a little bit and you've kind of touched on it briefly in terms of whether you're tackling like a single model mm. or armies or, or anything like that is restricting yourself to different levels if you like and obviously we have to do it through um the commissions because we offer different services course, yeah, so yeah. we're on the silver gold and i think it's funny a lot of the perception that people might have is that maybe someone would struggle to move up the levels but a lot of the issues that we have is people restricting themselves to the lower levels so people like george who can paint the gold tier just that that's their standard yeah if I give George a bronze model to paint, he struggles because it's like, yeah, yeah. where do I cut the corners and things like that? You had a black base from on, so that's game over. <laughs> <laughs> I have started, like, whenever I've allocated uh, George's thing, if it's got a black base room, I'll put in brackets, like, obviously. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, the, and actually a lot of, a lot of clients have started so referencing it. On We've the had spec. this with the clients now. I get a spec from the <laughs> yeah, clients have... in the spec and they'll be like jokes, like on the base room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's not what I was getting. I didn't want to go back to the base room. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you been trolled by the by the clients yeah. <laughs> uh, um i encourage it personally but the, um so what i'm getting at is you obviously then have to do that um yourself where it's like if you're painting a single model you can go to whatever this higher level that you've set yourself mm. or what you've just alluded to when you're painting an army you can strip things back do you have certain kind of set levels even if you haven't really written it like that or, yeah. or thought of it like that do you know okay i'm doing an army so here's what i'm gonna cut or here's what i'm gonna get to do you have that those i do things? yeah I, it, it depends on like the, the four so if i'm like doing napoleonics for instance there's a lot of figures that needed for that for the tabletop so i tend to base coat wash most of it it's rare that they get highlights except the face only highlight the face mm. and the reason for that is once they're based and the flags are up there the first thing you notice when the pelonics is not the face it's the flags it's the spectacle of like 24 to like 36 figures in line 
bright looking colors because when i wash them as well i don't like wash them straight from the pot and really thin it down so you get more of the color punching out and it's just like settled in the recesses a bit and the spectacle of that is like they're all in line they've got like red coats they've got big hats and there's like two big flags that so my my standard for that is like pretty much base coat shade don't do anything more with mm-hmm. that um like the muskets it's brown with some silver i've started using chrome pens now as well on like the bayonets because oh, right, okay. it catches the light really nice yeah we had some chat about pens on the we've like, had a little, a little while ago track. there's that um <laughs> that war colors company does oh, a goblin yes. green replicator like pen yeah <laughs> it's, like a highlight, it's like a highlighter pen so you can get the base room and just go around i heard about this one of the commenters pointed it out to us and i was like brilliant i'm getting one of those they only do goblin green yeah <laughs> which i actually kind of love that they do. Yeah. <laughs> no we'll do more we'll make them do more um don't but, say that there'll be an email about that. <laughs> there'll be an email coming in you guys are like where's black yeah, where's, where's <laughs> <my other?" laughs> why is it no black yeah. yeah um but yeah like with like big big forces like big battles big games that i definitely restrict the level um i've got um well i've not done it yet but i intend to do a diorama for salute which is going to be a british square but I will be putting a bit more effort into that. Mm. I've still decided how much effort because I'm going to probably turn it into a video as well. That'd so be mega, yeah. It's more just to make a diorama and put it into a salute. I don't expect to win anything. It'll be quite fun just to see how far it gets. That's a great it's, idea, Square. It, it's more the spectacle. I'm, I'm like testing myself as well. Like, it's not about the painting. It's about the narrative as well. Because for me, like when you when I've done dioramas in the past, the painting is important. But I think sometimes it's the storytelling that's yeah. going off in the diorama. And I think over the years, the dioramas, certainly from when I was a kid, have got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it's become a jewel. Um, and I want to go back to like the full sort of like, I've got 50, 60 figures on this diorama. Um, I think I can cut a couple of corners on the paint jobs because it's the spectacle that you're, you're going for. The emotion, the movement. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's just a test for that. But then if I roll back to like uh, Warhammer, then I will probably base coat shade, do a highlight. Um, if it's like a character, I'll probably put a couple more highlights into it and then there is the other level which is you know as, as i've done before like higher end stuff but that's usually if i'm just like in the mood for it yeah, yeah. Um, you do need to be in a specific frame yeah. of mind to do that because it, it is taxing like yeah. you know not to say that like i think painting high level similar to what i was saying at the very earlier in the episode like it just as much thought and process goes into painting so high end as doing an army that's consistent but not as much of a, of a level it's still taxing but hmm. I've been there batching through 40 models in one go or 50 models in one go or whatever blah blah and you do get to like number 48 out of 50 you're <laughs> like I've got two more you can do <laughs> yeah, just like come on so I know I, I do think it's just as taxing but I think there is like we always say there's that happy medium between between size hmm. and volume and, and level etc but the ability to fluctuate, I think, is really important as a painter. I think it's something that yeah. helps you to, I always call it like feed different fires. You know, like you've got that passion to do something really, but you want to be the pride of your collection or you've got that that, that thing that you, that, that spectacle, that that diorama, that arm, that, that, that emotion, that, that story that you want to tell that maybe doesn't need that as much, you know? So yeah. where yeah. does like painting for content come into all of this? Because yeah. something I've noticed is for obvious reasons, it's very, very difficult to paint really high-end stuff and consistently be putting out videos about mm. it just because of that time sink so do you find that having to paint projects to be on video is different to how you'd paint oh yeah personally yeah so um i mean i put time aside each day to to do my, my filming and stuff and if i have the energy or the enthusiasm i'll do stuff for myself in the evenings and i've got to the point now i'm like this could just be content i could just film this whilst i'm painting yeah. the only thing i find really hard with like the filming side of stuff if is you have to paint a little bit different than what you do when you're sat comfortably in your, your space. Because I have my model quite close up. I'm like painting. I can't do that with camera because you just be getting my ears and cheeks in the way all the time. Yeah. And I can't be like, oh, that's blurry. Oh, <laughs> it's better. Yeah. No, I missed it. Oh, it's dry. I've got to do that again. <laughs> so, you know, you're constantly having to like work to the camera, uh, which is a slightly different discipline than doing it for yourself. Um, but I do try and make time for at the moment it, it's been like a lot of star wars content uh, shatter points i don't know why i played a few games of shatter point i just really like the, the models are the great models, the models are really nice yeah. i'm just going to flip back to something about the standard as well mm. um, one of the things i tend to do is i like to camouflage my models with effects that are actually quite easy to do but look like i put more effort in so a lot of it's marking so if i do like some markings on like a stormcast like uh, heraldry on the shield or if i like do like uh, clone troopers with the uh, ahsoka markings the markings themselves because i found like ways of 
which will be a video at some point, like making the her actual markings on the helmet. I found a quick way of doing that. There's not, I say a quick way and, and a more approachable way of doing it. Um, but it makes the model look like I put more effort into mm. it than I actually have. And it's probably what I'd probably say is a tabletop standard, but because I put a marking on it, did that it in looks, the base coat yeah, stage, yeah, I've washed yeah. it. It looks like I've spent a lot longer on it, which has then camouflaged the model to then no longer be tabletop, but look like it's something else. So that's So huge. do you find that you like with the content, are you it's interesting when you speak to people about this because they kind of go one or two ways. Some people, like with the commissions on our team, for example, some people will be like, I'm painting commissions all day. When I do my own stuff, I just want to get it done. Yeah. Or there'll yeah. be other people who are like, oh, I have to paint it within this box because it's a commission. Yeah. When I do my own stuff, I want to go mad and I want to paint it to like the highest level possible. So for you, where does that line lie? So if you was hmm. not painting for video, would you find that it would be maybe less restricted or more restricted? Uh, I think it depends on what I'm painting, weirdly. If I'm doing... um. Like Napoleonics, like I said, I'll just be like bashing it out because I want to get them on the table and get to the part where I'm putting flags on because it looks cool. But if I'm doing like War Cry Kill Team, I'll put a bit more effort into like the highlights, maybe do like the old little jaggedy things to make like the cloth look torn, do more scratches on the arm and stuff. Again, it's that camouflage and thing, but I I tend to just go with the flow and just go, oh, I'm going to do that and oh, I'm going to do that. So I, I do put more effort sometimes, I think, into my own personal hobby. Um, again, because a lot of the stuff I do for camera is more like you can get to this point with these steps and it'll look like that. Um, and some of the things I do for myself, I'm like, oh, I should show to that because that's quite easy to do. But I think I need to make sure I get all the fundamentals covered first before I go down that route. So later on down the line, I'll do more like cool effects with simple methods or whatever. But yeah, I, 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 I guess it's the mood, what, what mood I'm in. If I'm mm -hmm. in a really sort of like, I want to put a bit more effort in mood. I'll do that. If I want to just like chill out and take my time, I'll do that. So yeah. I don't yeah. have a hard and fast rule, really. Sorry. I think that's like such a fence. Yeah. No, no, it's good <laughs> that's a good, it's good that's answer. That's like, it is a really good answer, actually, because it's like something that we've kind of touched on a few times is making sure that you're having fun with yeah. whatever you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And that, a large part of that is what am I in the mood for now? Yeah. Don't force myself to do something that I'm not in the yeah, mood for, yeah. kind of thing. Um, it does feel like the the kind of, fundamental like essential tip to army painting is like is those levels mm. understanding that those levels are okay and yeah. understanding what your version of those levels are yeah because that's i think some people are so surprised to hear that maybe our painters for example don't paint to that level all the time yeah they yeah. have their own stuff where they might paint a little bit less or same for yourself yeah. where like they'll see something that you've painted to a really high level and then see something that you haven't i think it people get surprised by that when I'm, really i think that's the key to actually managing to paint all that yeah stuff. yeah i mean i used to see every metal do that all the time there's a couple of guys that would do their own little armies and they were just like dry brushed um i'm just like i'm so proud <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm dry brushing. I'm like, do you even know what that technique is they're like yeah i found it out the other day in a book <laughs> <laughs> how to paint cinema miniatures from 1990 yeah, yeah. cool it's a great book that <laughs> red cover that one i think it is <laughs> if you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at siege head over to our patreon with the siege studios patreon you'll gain access to a catalog of over 250 pdf and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your paintings to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash C studios. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show in a future episode, please leave it in the comments down below on YouTube. Uh, this week we have a question from KGP277 who says, what are your thoughts on weathering and chipping with a sponge versus a brush? Ooh. Guess yes. We have a guest, so I one. think we should let the guest open on that one. Yeah. Mm, I, I, I mix it up. I use both. Mm. Um, so if I'm painting a space marine, I'll, I'll use sponge because it gives me nice, nice random effects on the armor. But there's just some places you can't get to mm. with the sponge, so I go in with a brush. And then I find once I've done those little bits of a brush, I just do a couple more around on the armor but i find the sponge sort of method is kind of erratic and um a little bit more what's the word uh oh god words peach <laughs> word amnesia it, it's it's not regimented it's the opposite of regimented no i get that yeah, yeah so it's like it's a bit all over the place where sometimes the danger when you're doing with a brush you can be a bit too sort of especially finicky. i find that i'm worse 
when I'm trying to be random and yes. sporadic with a brush. Random, that's the word. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> when I'm trying to be when I'm trying to be random with a brush, I end up overthinking it and just I look at it and then I'm like, okay, no, that looks like I've tried it to looks, be yeah, random. Yeah. That it, look random. It, it, it like looks cookie cutter basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. the the sponge, like you say, first step sponge is gonna go all over the different places you couldn't even work out how to do yeah. yourself. So it's like a great base layer for the weather in and then go in with the brush after, I think. I think a lot of people approach this in the sense of like what's speedy or more efficient, but I think something that's often overlooked is like the sense of scale. Mm. So for me personally, I find that a sponge is much more appropriate for a larger model yeah. because, you know, if a tank is being hit by, you know, massive shells and it's going to make bigger marks on it. But if you're just a Marine, you're getting hit with like shrapnel, you know, shrapnel you might just make a little nick or a scratch. Yeah. And it also kind of depends on, are we talking like armor or are we talking like, you know, other surfaces, how thick that is, what it's, what it's made of. Mm. I find that both is often great as well, because even like I said, like we, even if it is a massive model, odds are it's going to be hit with like debris and shrapnel as well as larger arms fire. So it's kind of like mixing up the different like scale for me uh, yeah. when I'm doing the brushes. Also, there is the sense of like, you can be much more precise of a brush completely, but making it like suit the model. That's something as well. This is like completely unrelated, but that's one of the reasons that I really love really, really, really small uh, tufts for basing because mm. it makes a Marine feel like he's nine yeah, foot tall yeah. rather than making him feel like, okay, we're supposed to be this like super soldier. But for some reason in this universe, it only seems to be very, very small tufts of six foot tall grass <laughs> always coming up to his hip. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to throw in two different directions into this because there's two things that I think that uh, I, I, I see a lot of people that use sponging on classes and whether we talk to people, et cetera, blah, blah. Every time when we do like a lot of weather in like t sort of tutorials and stuff like that, like a lot of people will go very heavy handed with a sponge, mm. like, and the whole less is more really, really does touching upon the scale thing. It really does contribute massively to that. I've had it before where someone's first, first go at doing like a weathered panel or something like that. They'll we'll show obviously doing, cause you could sit there theoretically and just do every single little dot, but then you have the thing that you were saying about where it gets cookie cutter or it looks, you're trying to be random and actually believe it or not, it's very difficult when you're painting miniatures and you're if you've had if you've had sort of like a, a, a training or like you've learned how to paint box art style or you've done more of an artistic style whatever blah blah because you're still following inadvertently a process it's actually really hard to do random like really yeah. really really hard yeah. especially between different models because even if you nail it on one you'll find that that's yeah. actually yes. your process yeah. for doing it. Yeah, and then yeah, you'll yeah. do it on a different model and you and go, oh, you're hit by the exact thing. Really. <laughs> the exact same thing at the exact same time. Every, everyone's taking, everyone's diving in front of everyone yeah, else. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, shots. Um, but yeah, like, a lot of people go very heavy handed with sponging to start off with, I find like, cause it's like, oh yeah, get it on the yeah, model. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like, oh, what have I created? You it's know, so like, fun. Yeah. It's so easy to over. Yeah, it's, it's so it's, hard to restrict yourself. It touches back to that thing with that episode with Dave where he was the blood effects. He's just like flicking it at the model or yeah, whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's very much like, it's very much like it, it, being more subtle with it and gentle with it. And also touching on the second point, which is the kind of twofold. It's like thinking how that, that object has interacted with the environment and what actually would get damaged or would get affected or what wouldn't. Um, the common one is that you'll have transfers or freehand marking or something on the panel and you, you sponge all over the model to create damage, but then you don't do the transfer or you, you don't put do the transfer. Thing, so yeah. So yeah. you're going to shoot everything and then go, oh, a lovely bit of art. I can't see that. Yeah, like, you, know, like, you know, so there's that. Um, and the other thing is obviously material as well. Um, like I think sponging can be used for all manner of different textures. It's like instinctively, a lot of people approach it in the thought process of doing it for like rust and stuff mm. like that, which is, which is perfect because you can do two tone, the highlight color and the chip color or the rust color, whatever, blah, blah. But like you were talking earlier and something to touch upon is obviously like cloth and fabric. Yeah. Like you can do amazing, amazing texture on cloth, like with tiny bits of sponge, like uh, Daz has done that thing where he puts the sponge inside the yes. thing that you lose all the time, which yeah. I can't remember what it's called, the brush protector. Oh, like the brush cap. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I lose them all the time. And apparently I said that on a podcast thinking I'd have loads of comments of people being like, Oh yeah, I lose them as well. Every comment was but, like, "How do you lose that?" Like, there's what? a special wormhole where they go in. Yeah, because yeah. I've had that. Yeah, I, yeah. I've got one that I still can't find. It was like literally on my, next to my tissue. Yeah, it's just exactly. Gone. Yeah, it's, just gone. Oh, yeah. it's gone. It's I, that thing where like you put you put it down on the desk, you turn your head away, you turn back, and it's gone. It's yeah, gone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was airbrushing the other day on my booth, and literally, I for some reason I I, I use a a, a a big base as like a test test surface just to make sure the, the consistency is right on the on the airbrush when I've done a dilution. And I knocked it underneath the, there's a little like lip underneath the, the oh, I think, no. 
And I lifted the thing up. There was about five. Under the floor. <laughs> I was like, I found it. I found where they go. Yeah. Um, but what I was trying to say was like that, that putting that sponge in like the, in the brush protector, it's really good for like being able to control it. Yeah. And then, and then like you can get a tiny bit of sponge, put it in the end. And then like, if you've got like a loincloth, you can do like several stages of sponging and the depth that it gives you on like material is really yep. good rather than, because I, cross action is really good. If you can get those straight lines as really tiny as possible as you can, he obviously, but otherwise the weave would be like, yeah. like crazi, if that makes sense. Uh, but it's kind of like a hybrid stippling really. At that yeah, point, isn't it? yeah. Yeah. But then, but then also like other things like sponge, the other good thing with sponging as well, just like, it's not even like, I think again, it's something that is massively overlooked, like you said, whereby like, you know, obviously Byron from AO, for example, he puts down like a sponge layer first mm. before he does like stuff as well. So it's like, oh, it's like stipple on or sponge on and then we'll do the dry brushing over the top if that makes sense. So it almost makes like a really good foundation for then building other paints and stuff on as well. I think, as I said, sponging is massively overlooked in some cases um, and it can add so much to a model, even whatever level you're trying to yeah. paint to or whatever kind of like finish yeah. you're trying to paint to as well. So well, you mentioned about the texture on cloth. I've done it a few times where I've used sponge and it gives it a nice sort of like a, I wouldn't say velvet, but it kind of gives that kind yeah, of yeah. texture that velvet has if you, you just work on those those edges a bit, but it looks quite nice. A couple of glazes and then, uh, yeah, yeah, it looks really yeah, good. Yeah. Good for blood as well. Yeah. Blood mm. splatter. Yeah. And talking about scale, like, you know, and using a sponge is good for like things like Ad um, Adeptus Titanicus stuff because then your, your dots are a bit smaller. So mm. it kind of scales a bit better because if I like try and do blood splatters on Adeptus Titanicus stuff, it's like... It's had a bath. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, like, it's, it's like huge. It's like, yeah. But yeah, well, but the, you, same, the same thing works for like chips as well because like you, I've seen Adeptus Titanicus stuff and the chips are like massive on it. It's like, what, has someone thrown like a bus? <laughs> <laughs> someone thrown like a bus at the Titan or something. Like It's like it's like a massive chip, right? But yeah. Something so, that's really nice to do as well is like you put down your layer with the sponge in like uh, your highlight color and then going in with a brush of a slightly brighter color and yeah. using that sponge layer as a guide and just picking up a few of those little markings and mm. just making them just a little bit brighter. So it looks like it's a high, like it's a damage to the paint rather than going down to the Yeah, material. it's like multiple yeah. stages. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, yeah. That's, that's awesome. And that helps with the randomness as well because you've kind of already got this template that the sponge has given you and that gives you just something to follow. Like you're just painting over what's already there. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, it's cool. really, really good. I've got a question to throw at you. Sure. Uh, something I've always experienced when I was in the oil painting team. Do you guys highlight your transfers or your decals? Oh, that's a difficult Ooh, one. That's that's that came up. That came up in your video recently. Yeah. So I watched that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, that, that that's kind not of, a question you get often, is no, it? No, it yeah. isn't. No, that's a really interesting one. Um, I thought your point of it's something that's been painted on the model, so would it wouldn't have an edge to catch light unless it's on an edge of a piece unless of it's armor. On the edge of a yeah. piece of armor. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. I, 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 but then, but then at the same time, when I freehanded stuff. I put edges on it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's a real, it's a real, real, yeah, that's an odd. I have odd. a good answer for this. Come Go on for in. it. Come on then. I don't highlight them. I shade them. Oh. So oh. for example, say like, a, say like an ultra classic ultramarine shoulder pulse and transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't edge it. Yeah. Because that doesn't make sense because it's not an edge. Yeah. But I yeah. will, like if you're painted to a high level model, you'll see, especially level metal do this, like they'll glaze down the volume. So yeah. towards the bottom of the shoulder, it's slightly darker. It's in shadow because it's got the high point at the top. So I'll follow the same suit with the transfer. So say with the ultramarine, it's like the white. I'll go in with like a slightly off-white or like a darker uh, grey and I'll glaze that towards the bottom yeah, of the transfer sense, just yeah. to show the volume. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is our little closing segment that we do every single show called Hobby Hacks. This is where we share a little hack with you that you can hopefully implement into your painting. Mm. And this week we have one from our guest. Oh, yeah. So I what, do an indeed have one. what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you may have seen it on some of the videos I've done in the past. You may not be aware of it, but I use masking tape to make clothes and cloth. I don't use green stuff. And the reason for that is every time I've tried to use green stuff, I always get it wrong. There's so many fingerprints on it and it ends up being thicker than fabric itself. So I've started using masking tape and I cut it to the shape I wanted to do. So like if I'm doing a cloak, I'll like do like a little bit of a cloak shape and I could just manipulate it around the model, drop a super glue, it folds however you want it to fold. Once you spray it, it goes quite hard. A few people in the comments have gone, but it's tacky on one side. Not when you spray it, it's not. <laughs> it's gone. Trust me, it's gone. Um, but then I started experimenting doing other things like bandages. I did like a, a talon with like the head wrap. So I used a Cadian, filed down the head a bit, and then just did a, a head wrap fan in just twisting the masking tape. So I did like a big long strip of it. I found just by twisting it as I'm going around the head, gave it more volume and like kind of like just bulbous as you yeah. expect from like a head wrap <laughs> but if you just do it straight as it is it just looks stupid and comical yeah um but i use masking tape for so much 
That's brilliant. That. I've never heard that. I've, That's amazing. Yeah, it's quite rare that we come up. With, we often joke about how bad some of these hobby hacks are. I've <laughs> After never 41 episodes, that. they're getting a bit thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard I've never heard that. that. Yeah. That's I've, quite incredible. I yeah. made uh, a really sexy looking uh, ogre for my daughter's account because I do I some... never thought I'd hear anybody I ever know. say I made a sexy looking ogre. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. So I, I did some man eaters uh, for my AOS stuff and I've got like daughters of cane and I thought I'm going to do a, an ogre for the daughters of cane but he needs thigh high boots. How do I make thigh high boots on an ogre? It's the most disturbing thing I've ever done. <laughs> uh, it was the fire belly who's like doing that but in the end I gave him like a shield and a dagger and he had like a weird sort of mask which kind of fit with the sisters of slaughter. Yeah, yeah. And I just used masking tape, give him thigh high boots, and it looked mega <laughs> disturbing. But mega. That is amazing. This yeah, might that... be the best hobby hack we've ever had. I'm actually yeah. not even joking. That's yeah. more actually an insult to us than <laughs> 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 All right, speak for yourself, Slate. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it just it just take a bit of time getting used to like folds and stuff. And I've shown a few people like in person doing it. Um like I did I did some uh, Tanith and I made because I had like a load of spare Cadians and the new plastic Tanith guys came out that looked really nice. And I tried to mimic that kind of poncho cloak and they have like some little tabs yeah, on the yeah. side so I just use like little bits of masking tape which are just cut out to make the tabs and it just looked fine can I ask how you had like how you had this idea in the first place a necessity because I had no green stuff on down and I needed to do a cloak <laughs> and I went oh 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 that's oh, right. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to touch on this with the fact that you said about green stuff because I you know I see see the, some of the stuff that some of the CS team do with like like capes and robes and stuff I'm like how have you got that thin or how have you sculpted yeah. that whatever blah blah and normally when I've ever tried to do capes or stuff like that, most most normally capes, they end up looking like, have you ever seen clothes when they've been on the washing line in winter where they're frozen? Yes. They're frozen yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like it looks like the cape is like that. It's like it's a solid piece of looks like yeah, card like like, rather yeah. than flowing lovely material. It's like this this cape that just projects diagonal at a perfect angle out of the model. Um, so that's really interesting. I'd say like the, the genius behind using that is just yeah. it's just crazy. Maybe the masking tape will solve that for you. Yeah, mm. that is absolutely mega. You get folds in it, stays in place, spray yeah. it. Use a bit of PVA if you want to harden it a bit more, but the spray does it. It's that's fine. mega. I never, Amazing. That's absolutely awesome. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you, Peachy, very much for coming. Thank you. Yeah. So thank if you, you want to uh, tell all the listeners where they can go find your new channel. You can go and find me on Peachy Tips. And if you don't know what that is, it's my new channel and it looks like a teapot. <laughs> that's a paint pot. That's a teapot. It's me. <laughs> And the socials are all peachy tips. All peachy tips now, yeah. They'll, all be, uh, they'll all be linked in the description as well. If you're oh, thank you YouTube very much. And in the show thank notes you. if you're listening on audio. Oh. Yeah, and ju just to add for um, for you didn't, I did not find Peachy in the tea aisle. It was, he it did. Was, yeah, I did. He did. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Don't it. shatter the illusion. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, thank you very much, Peachy. Thank and you. And thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. We will see you next week. Bye.